Sam Watson tell us a little bit more about Equiloom, Sam. You are a, a proud Equiloom rider. Uh, just give us an insight uh, as to what it is all about. They are a company all about bringing nature's light, that, that quality that of light that we get from nature, making sure that that is there for the horses, whether they are stabled, whether they're in the middle of a long winter or whatever it is, that they're not being deprived uh, of any of that quality of light. Obviously, as we know as humans, that we have a circadian rhythm. We are responsive to light. It affects us mentally. It affects us physically. So that the areas that I love about Equilume as a performance rider is I think that muscle growth and that muscle recovery, I think the physical side of it is being able to help my equine athletes to perform and to recover well, both of those hugely affected by it. On today's episode of the Equ Ratings Eventing Podcast, we have brought you a classic show. Now, this was actually an Equilum special, and it was all about optimising breeding. So Sam was joined by the head of equine science at University College Dublin, the lovely Dr. Barbara Murphy, who has been on the show a few times before, to basically look at how the science and technology behind Equilume can help you get the most out of your breeding programme. It is well worth a listen. It is a good time of year to be listening as well. Uh, So here it is. Optimising breeding, an Equilume special. For more information, just go to equilume.com. They'd be more than happy to answer any questions you've got. This was actually released uh, December 2022, so nearly a year ago. Hope you enjoy. Welcome, everyone, to the Equilume's Eventing podcast. And... This is this is a very interesting one. And uh, if, like me, you're interested in all different ways of of life and how we work, you know, this is this is the big thing that I find always interesting when we're when we're talking to uh, Barbara, who we've talked to before. But with, with the Equilum product, we're always talking about light, and we're talking about the effect that light has on us. And look, we're recording this deep in the middle of, of winter. Uh, you might be listening to it at any time of year, but it has such an effect on us. And I find this conversation fascinating, just even thinking of myself as a human being and, and the effect on, on my mood and, and my performance uh, as a human being. So hopefully this, this entire show and, and uh, concept is going to be of interest to you. Specifically, what we're going to be diving into um, it's going to be more of the breeding side of things that that breeding season is around the corner, uh, as, as we say, optimistically in the depths of winter right now, waiting for spring and encouraging spring to come on. Uh, but Dr. Barbara Murphy, welcome back to the show. And you are going to be the person to shed light on all of this for us. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sam. Delighted to be back with you again. So I am being very kind of selfish here because I have two wonderful mares. Uh, one has just finished racing. Um, she, she's a six-year-old and um, she's now just literally just run her last race. So she's, she's um, actually coming up from the UK and we're going to be thinking about, about covering her because she's a thoroughbred early, you know, as early as possible in the season. So we're, we'll, we'll talk about um, that type of a, a situation and then we've also got the same with the sport horse where maybe the um the you know the timing the earliness isn't quite so important because they it's going to be sort of later on in their career when we'll we'll be thinking about selling that horse but let's let's start with this concept this this a mare who's not been in full and and is kind of fresh and a kind of a blank canvas in in many ways and how are we going to go about getting her ready for the breeding season Okay, well, it's nice to have a a specific case to to have a look at. So, I mean, in general, most of your listeners understand that as the days get longer, this is what switches on the reproduction hormones for mares and how they actually respond to the environment is through the length of day. So as the days get longer, the nights get shorter And during the nighttime, there's an important hormone called melatonin produced. And when there is a really long duration of melatonin, as there is right now in these long, dark nights, this switches off the reproductive axis for the mare and stops the release of reproductive hormones from the brain that act on the ovaries. But as the days would naturally start to get longer, March into April is when most mares would transition in. And of course, for the the thoroughbred industry, 
we have economic pressure on breeders to produce early foals um, because these are the foals that once they turn one year of age become the mature yearlings, the precocious two-year-olds that we hope will be mature, ready to run and will make us the big bucks. So for a maiden mare, which is in your case, there are some important things to think about. For maiden mares, there's a, it's, it's a quite a stressful transition to go from their competitive career at a racetrack or a racing yard to life as a horse, because that's what you're giving them now is you're, you're letting them come back, have pasture time. Um, but also when we talk about maiden mares, particularly that have been in training and that have been stabled every day, it's important that we don't stress their system too much by putting them straight out in the cold in this weather. So blanketing would be important um, and maintaining their their nutrition at a, at a good high level so that they're not going into the season underweight, that they have an optimum weight. And when it comes to lighting, if you want to, which I'm sure you do, breed from her early, right at this time, um, we ideally start around the 1st of December. So every week that you start light therapy after the 1st of December, the rule of thumb is a week later for the first ovulation. And it takes 70 days on average. So 10 weeks from the start of putting mares under a long day length. So we're going to stimulate the spring photo period that they would normally get in March and April by putting them under light for 16 hours a day, approximately. And you could do this mares that are used to your your typical breeding stock that have a foal most years that are pregnant or that are um, are used to living outdoors. You could use a light mask with these mares and leave them out where they'd be naturally more fertile because they're moving and this helps with their uterine tone. They're with their bodies. So this helps with their stress levels. And unless the conditions get very, very bad and horses are pretty good at dealing with cold because they have their own little internal furnace, their hind gut. So as long as they're getting plenty of good forage, they can keep themselves warm. No problem whatsoever. They don't like the, the driving rain as much. That's where we need to protect them. So no, with none, a maiden of us. Mare, none of us. Yeah, I know. So with your maiden mare, you, you, as soon as you get her back or before you get her back, she should be under lights. She should be getting a long day length. And the sooner you start, the more cycles you have to work with earlier in the season. So because is there, probably... is, there a set num- is there a set number of cycles, Barbara? Is that is that a, is that a, a true thing? Um, mares are very variable. OK, so generally when mares start cyc- cycling naturally in April, they will continue cycling until the start or mid-December. So a lot of people think that they stop cycling, you know, in June, but the natural breeding season would run from April, May, June, July, August. And when we did our first studies with the light mask, it was kind of the first time the vets I was working with in order to get a cohort of mares that we wanted to work with. We wanted to see if they were all in winter shutdown so that we could use the light to bring them forward. So we palpated a lot of mares to look at their ovarian activity in late November and there was about 65% of them still cycling. So right. when they act, when they actually do shut down is around December, mid-December, a lot of mares. And of course, there's lots of factors that control this. The age of the mare, her nutrition, you know, how much energy she has. But, but a lot of mares will keep going until November, early December. But when they are not cycling is January, generally January, February, March, when we want them to be. So really... Six months of the year, they're cycling well. There's two months coming in, two months coming out when they're transitional. And then they're out of season for three to four months when they're not cycling. That is what the normal mare does. But most people don't own normal mares. But that's that's the rule of thumb. So with your thoroughbred mare, you can use the stable lights to allow her transition into uh, kind of life in, in, in a breeding role. And so that she's not turned out into this nasty, cold, frosty weather straight away. And it would be really important that if she is obviously blanketed at the racing yard, that she will be continued to be kept warm when she moves to your place. So starting her under lights as soon as you can. The nice thing about the, the, the stable light is to help with stress. 
in horses or or a a big transition in an animal's life following transport. The Equilume Stable Light has that lovely red light function at night, which seems to have a calming effect on horses and allows their natural melatonin to rise at night, but allows them to rest. And um, we're hoping we'll see in some studies that we're doing that it improves the sleep behavior and their subsequent kind of mood and and well-being um, when they have that nice red light at nighttime. So the stable light provides the blue and rich light by day for the the um, 16 to 17 hours. It, instead of having an, an abrupt light on, light off at dawn and dusk, which can be stressful for horses, anyone who's walked into a barn and turned a white light on in the middle of the night will know that they get a kind of a, a jumpy response from from the inhabitants of the stables, as we all would if someone turns the light on over us at nighttime. But the dawn um, transition, the gentle changing of the light in the equilibrium stable light from red up to a bright white in the morning seems to be kind of helping in keeping them less stressed as well. Yeah, it's cool walking into the into the barn and having um well, A, being able to, to operate on those, you know, very early starts and things like that, that you don't have to, to shock everybody else and wake everybody else up that, that you still have it. Um, but it's also pretty peaceful. You know, this, this time of year, all of our horses are on the, um, on the short day. So um, when we're going to check them at nighttime as well and, and, and look at them, it's, it's pretty peaceful. Um, it's a lovely it's a lovely aura to be walking into a barn with the red lights on Um, and it's just very handy that you yeah you can do all those little checks and things like that and just see that everyone's fine without having to turn on a bright light at you know nine o'clock at night or ten o'clock at night very good and for your sport horse mare when do you hope to to breed her probably it's it kind of comes down to logistics more than anything i think there's there's two things that i'm trying to balance off and consider one if we were to use frozen semen um you know for if we're going for a for a, a kind of a, a higher value stallion that's that's harder to get maybe maybe one from europe um and it's expensive and it's um and you know potentially more tricky as well you're thinking of starting early enough so that if you know if it didn't if the first one didn't work you know you still you're you're not getting too late uh, yeah. for your second go it's a little bit of kind of a defense strategy there but obviously hopefully you're you're looking for success and we'll we'll talk about maximizing that chance of success early march you're talking about a foal then being born in february which is probably logistically than anything else we we try and have we obviously love when the thoroughbred foals are that are, are born at that time of year but it's colder the the fields aren't as in good condition um you're having to support a little bit you know it's there's just a little bit more work whereas when the bo- when the foals are born in may um it's so what you're getting them turned out so quickly um and they're starting to spend much more time outside for longer periods so it's just it's just a lot easier so i would say we'll maybe think at the end of march um okay. of look first go with our sport horse mare and and if she was happy enough to to live outside when the weather is is nice enough then obviously the the lighting could be provided to her using one of our breeding light masks um, and what it really does is it gives you more chances to have a successful outcome the earlier they start cycling um, i have always found from talking to a lot of breeders that the first it's the second ovulation of the season which can be more um more successful so when you imagine that a mare starts cycling for the first time her hormones aren't hitting their peak levels so the cycling starts the transitional period is a bit erratic and sometimes um, after they ovulate the empty follicle produces a hormone called progesterone and that's really important for maintaining pregnancy for maintaining pregnancy in the early weeks Um, for keeping the uterus um, a really nice environment for the embryo to implant. But what we find is if you sometimes if you breed mares on their very first ovulation of the season, there isn't enough progesterone being produced by that first corpus luteum, that empty follicle. So oftentimes the next or the second ovulation can be more fertile. And that's why it's nice if the sooner you start, the more, the faster she's stably cycling and you have more cycles to, to work from. And especially when you're using frozen semen, which is very expensive and you have to time the insemination so carefully 
um, with the timing of ovulation, you want the best chances of success. So oftentimes, um, if she has been cycling once or twice before that, um, had a couple of ovulations, then she's more likely to be successful in maintaining the pregnancy once she conceives. That is very interesting. And I think um, kind of reassuring, you know, we, we're, we're set up with um, obviously all, all of the lights, both, for, both in where the mares are in pens uh, and with the masks for the, for the mares that are out. Um, so yeah, getting, making sure that the, that the system is, is up and active and getting going um, nice and early, like not, not, it doesn't have to be ridiculously early, but I guess, I bet, guess Barbara, you could have a mare who could be quite slow and maybe that first gestation period only coming in April, say, uh, if they're a little bit slow. So then you might only be ha- kind of up and running by May and then it is starting to get quite late. Um, certainly if, if again, if, if you're having to have a couple of attempts and things like that. So um, good information absolutely, to know absolutely, that. To get them going. Now, a very interesting subject here that um, I didn't think about at all. Um, and it's about when, when, the, when even in utero, when we have this little embryo or whatever we are, my biology isn't the best, Barbara, but when there is a foal growing inside as mummy's tummy, um, that we can already be preparing that horse for a, a, an athletic career uh, as a high-performing athlete. Um, talk to me about that side of things. Yeah, I mean, people don't realize that, you know, the environment that the foal develops in influences its development and it makes sense when you put it like that so if you think about it nature intended foals to be born during the longest days of the year when there's plenty of bright light long days and that light turns on not just reproductive hormones for the mare but it turns on growth hormones most people know that as the days get longer Horses start to put on more muscle, respond better in training, can have this summer vigor effect. Well, that all comes from the fact that the busiest time in a horse's life, if they were living in the wild, is during springtime when reproductive activity, when mares are foaling and being rebred, stallions are fighting off other stallions, chasing down their mares, everybody's moving, it's all go, go, go. So everything needs to be growing as fast as it can needs to be muscles need to be maturing horses need to be putting on muscle weight so that's kind of why the 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 time of year not only influences when the mare starts to cycle but it also plays a role in the development of the foal and normally if mares were bred in april or may and june they would be foaling april may when the mare would have been receiving the natural long day light that causes an increase in growth hormones in her circulation. And we know that these hormones, either directly or indirectly, are communicated to the foal to encourage the maturation of the foal in utero. And to try and get people to explain this, if you look at pregnancy lengths across the breeding season, the longest pregnancy lengths occur earlier in the year when the foot mares are falling during the darkest days. The shortest pregnancy lengths occur May, June, July, when light is there to stimulate the foal's development in utero. So they grow at the right pace. They run out of room on time. And when a foal runs out of room and gets a little bit stressed in a tight space in its mummy's tummy, that's when parturition or the falling cascade starts and the the foal is born. And the other really interesting fact is that the foals that are born early in the year, on average, are have a lower foal birth weight than the foals that are born closer to when nature intended, May, June, July. So we found about a four kilo or 10 pound difference between foals born in January and foals born in June. And this seems to be consistent. And we now know that it's light that regulates this and it's light to the mare in her final trimester of her gestation. So around 100 days before the mare's due date, if you return the long day light therapy to the pregnant mare, it influences the foal's development. And we have shown this recently in a really nice two year study that was done at Brandenburg State Stud in um, in Germany. Uh, with Christine Aurich's research group at the University um, in Vienna. 
they showed that foals born to mares wearing light masks that receive the light in the last 100 days, they get to their feet 15 minutes faster. <laughs> when you take a blood sample, they have a higher what's known as neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. So they look at the proportion of white blood cells there that dictate how strong their immune system is. They have a stronger immune system because they have been under the influence of hormones circulating in the mare that influence maturity. We, when I did the very first study that looked at pregnancy length and also full birth weight, we found about an eight and a half pound or four kilo weight difference in foals that were born um, from mares wearing light masks. So when you put it all together, you are, you know, that is the environment. And the really interesting thing about growth in the horse's life, the fastest period of daily growth in the horse's life occurs in the three months before it is born. That's before when it's born. Interesting. Before right. it is born. After that, every single day, the average daily gain decreases. So that last three months, there's this rapid rise because, and what's being put down? the skeletal framework for the future athlete, the cartilage framework that makes up the bone structure and the bone mineralization, which is only partially complete when the foal is born. But that period of time is crucially important for the development of what should hopefully be the, the future athlete. And a lot of people, if you look back at all the racing records and you look at Kentucky Derby winners and you look at that, people say, oh, all of the best racehorses were often born later in the year. This was before we knew anything about how light therapy could influence the development of the foals. But a lot of, a lot of people look for foals that are not born that early, that are born a little later. But nowadays, we can correct the problem we created by having this unnaturally early breeding season, but just giving the mares back light. And really, when some of the, the feedback we get from many of the breeders that use Equilum find that when they start using it on their pregnant mares, they're seeing re reductions in their pregnancy length and really nice, mature, big foals that are healthy. And the more times they use it, they're tightening up their breeding season each year because they're stopping mares that are going past their due dates um, and that are slowing down everything um, and waiting for light to, to, to be right for them to, to do what nature intended. I think the um, I think thoroughbred breeders in particular must be really pricking their ears at this because there's such, um, you know, there's such a commercial element to it but and, and and there's a i guess there's there's a there's a reason for that you know with the with the national hunt horses in particular you know that that bigger frame and and that stronger athlete they do perform well and there is a there is a high demand for them and it's very important come the sale time you know the difference between being 16 hands versus 16 one or two in that sales ring is is a is a very um it's like falling off a cliff in, in terms of price and things like that so um it's it is and it's amazing thinking you know a, a lot of people will be thinking oh you know when they're when they're a two turning three-year-old if we're, if we're producing this horse for the store horse sales you know let's let's really get the feed into this horse now and see can we help it to grow um but it sounds like we're about three years too late <laughs> at that point well i mean that there's a lot that can be done after the foal is born but you kind of want to give it the best start in life and to have the strongest immune system during those first critical few months. And with regard to height, what we've noticed mostly, because I didn't record height in my studies, um, but we see in the German study, there was a slight reduction in the height of about less than one centimeter in the folds that were born to the light masks. So I'm not going to say that they're born bigger, but they're born heavier. So there's no, because there was no difference in weight or an increase in weight, what that tells me is it's greater bone density. So mm -hmm. you have a stronger animal. So not, I mean, particularly in, in the flat racing, it's not always the, 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 the tallest horse that's the most yeah. desirable. It, it's the one with the best bone and the most yeah. best durability. Yeah. Yeah. Getting, getting that, that power, strong, a strong athlete, you know, and I think whatever they're, I think, you know, what type of athlete they are is, is going to be um, down to the genetics a little bit, whether you're, you're breeding show jumpers or, or dressage horses, event horses, flat jumping, uh, racing, which, whichever road you're going down. 
Um, but in all of those cases, we're all talking about an athlete and we're all talking about development, um, you know, physical development uh, as that athlete. And certainly we don't want them to be deprived in, in, in any way or, or, you know, kind of cut short on any of those things. Um, so let's, let's talk then a little bit later on. I mean, I, I find it fascinating that the, the whole a, a with, with, with getting the mare in full B this, um, you know, these, these final few months of the, the pregnancy as well, that that's, a, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and as you, I think the key point that I took out of that is that the old fashioned way of, of trying to start early to almost artificially have a more mature horse come sales time, um, simply just because you're starting earlier, the horse is going to be older. And that's, that's all it was, was mm-hmm. potentially from nature. You know, there was a little bit of, of a natural deficit um, because, th- because they were growing in a, you know, in a less natural time of year. So being able to compensate for that is, a, is surely a game changer uh, and very interesting. And, and so then what, what we're doing, let, let's say we have a, a foal, we're thinking about the yearling stage is when we're, we, we want to um, go to the sales. So we, we've got, a, we've got a, a bit more time now. Um, you know, we've got another year and a half, I guess, from, from when this healthy foal has hit the ground. Um, what, are we go, what are we going to be doing, let's say, with, the, with their first winter uh, as a foal? With regard to how you would manage them under lights or... Yeah, I, th- I think so. So what I would be thinking is, is again, we want this horse to keep developing um, mm-hmm. a as yes. as naturally, but b as you know, w- w- without any, as I kind of say, you know, natural constraints. Which I think in it feels to me in Ireland, uh, you know, when I see people going off to the Sunshine Tour, uh, whether yeah. it's in America, in Florida, or over here going to Spain, and they're kind of setting off at the end of you know beginning of fe- February maybe. Uh, and I kind of getting quite envious of them because I'm like, God, it feels like I've already had four months of winter. Do I really need another month uh, here in February? So can we, I know they're still going to need a winter, but, um, mm. you know, is it beneficial to, to, to make that a little bit shorter if we can? Uh, absolutely. I mean, depending on where you are in the world, your, your day length and your temperature, and there's so many different uh, climatic changes and light changes depending on the latitude that horses are kept at. But one of the the things that we can do is if horses can't be left outdoors under the optimum lighting, which is provided by nature, even though in some places there is a long winter, we have carefully developed lighting programs that maximize the circa annual the the annual internal rhythms in horses for with, with regard to their when they develop and grow and the idea with with one this program that we have with our stable light is it does two things first it improves the daily health of the animal because wherever we are there's going to be really dark foggy days if anybody's living in Kildare at the moment uh, it is very very dark and foggy most of the days and that's not ideal for the horse's body clock to operate so the first thing that you can do with your young animals is ensure they're getting blue enriched light by day so really good lighting in the stable and rest at night but the second internal rhythm that's so crucial for horses is they do have an annual rhythm we've talked at length about the annual rhythm at reproduction and i touched on the fact that because they have this reproduction rhythm, they also have this natural rhythm when they tend to put on more muscle, um, gain weight, improve their metabolism. So as the days are getting longer, horses are in like muscle production mode. They're getting ready for the active reprodu- repro season. And as the days are getting shorter and in winter, they change their metabolic activity a little bit. I mean, they still perform really well but they will put more emphasis on maybe storing fat rather than working on muscle. So there's times of year regulated by day length when horses potentially perform better. And what we try to do is you cannot get rid of the annual rhythm for a horse. It it exists internally. If you try to keep the lights the same duration all year round, you'll still find a horse that eventually blows their coat. But what you can do is you can maximize that rhythm by limiting giving them a shorter winter period 
that still maintains strong circadian rhythms, but bringing spring forward sooner, and our stable lights adjust automatically every day, but do so ahead of nature. So it brings them forward sooner. It doesn't need to be an abrupt transition like it does for our breeding stock. This can happen more gradually with our performance animals to allow appetite, metabolism, muscle development to increase slowly. And then we give them a long summer, just like many of us would like to be living in Florida. We Mm. give the horses a long summer if they're in their stable. So from around the 3rd of April, on our circa annual program, that's when they hit their maximum day length. And we hold the summer day length until the start of September. So they keep that high level of summer vigor and performance longer into the year. And you must give them a little, not not really a break. It's not a downtime. Horses can perform all year round, but you need to let their body see, okay, it's winter now time to because otherwise they'll do it themselves when you don't want them to if you want their coats looking really well for the majority of the year you still need them to let them get a little bit of a winter coat at some point and then they will shed them again sooner as you bring forward the lighting and sam i know you've 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 had your horses under this system for quite a while what have your observations been to to be honest it's the amount of of clipping and particularly at the end of the season so they hold their coats much better so i think anyone who's who's um i think show jumpers event look i think actually everyone um i'm I'm sure the racing guys experience this as well but you get to end of set middle end of september beginning of october and you're sometimes looking at a horse going oh god i'm gonna have to 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 clip them um before this next you know big international or, or whatever we're aiming for um now we we've competed horses at Buccalo, Le Leon, since we've had the lights. Now that's getting into mid to late October. And I remember with Flamenco, you know, we, di- we didn't have to clip him. And it was amazing. And that this would be a horse who would definitely, you know, the coat would normally be turning in at the end of September. Um, so, so you notice that. Um, I've, I've loved the, the influence on the, on the horse's mood. Um, mm-hmm. And again, there's a lot that's of products cool. that, that, that will kind of say, make your uh, lazy horses more energetic and make your uh, wild horses more calm. But I, I couldn't have had two different horses in terms of um, at the time when we put in the lights, it was Arda Highlight, who was quite sharp and alert all the time, kind of too much so really for dressage. And Imperial Sky, who was very, very laid back and every day felt a little bit like, you know, labored and hard work. Um, Imperial Sky pepped up and, and the and the... I could see it physically, you know, I think we just gave his system a massive shot. And I think physically and mentally, he was just operating so much more efficiently, you know, particularly again, this horse in in the winters. And you're thinking to yourself, there's loads of other excuses as well. Like we, we work in an indoor school a lot during the winter in Ireland. It's quite small. It's 20 by 40. And you're thinking to yourself, oh God, he's probably just getting sick of being in the same small space. Now he'd been in that space all his life. But the difference between when he was, when we didn't have lights um, five years ago to now having, having the lights in the, in the last few years of his career, um, he, was, he was absolutely on fire in that, in that small space, you know, really working well, really working to a high level. And I guess like a lot of things, it just, it helped his body to perform better. I, I was even thinking that, you know, the amount we were feeding him and things like that wasn't really changing but in my head I'm thinking I just think he's utilizing everything better yeah and his yeah. system just used to shut down a bit um, yeah I mean it's it's incredible and I mean people people kind of laugh at me sometimes they go oh come on you can't say light does everything but when you look at the pathway that light takes when it enters the eye and the right quality light stimulating receptors that we only discovered in t- the last 20 years in mammals that control a part of the brain that regulate every single organ in the body to allow that body clock to do things in tune with each other so that every organ is working in tune and in synchrony and in harmony. And just the the internal rhythm of an animal with good lighting, it's one of the reasons why we have so many issues with human health in shift workers, in office workers with poor lighting and how this is such an, an important area in human medicine. So... Um, and I, I love your comment about, and I mean, people go, well, how did one horse calm down and one horse pep up? But everybody reacts differently when they're in a good mood. People who are, 
you know, kind of depressed if they ha- if if they get loads of sunshine are going to be more energetic. And people who may be a little bit, you know, on the spectrum, OCD, ADHD and just jumping up and down might be more relaxed when they get good sunshine and take a, a, you know, a two week holiday in the sun. So it's the same thing for horses. And the really cool thing is I was at a conference in May, the uh, Society for Research on Biological Rhythms, which is an amazing conference they hold in the US every two years. And it's everybody who researches chronobiology across the species on the planet. So we have lobster people, we have, you know, algae people, we have people working on humans, people working on frogs and me on horses, all because this this biological rhythm and the receptor the reception of light and the control of the internal workings of an organism is conserved across every animal on the planet. And one of the new findings that came out was from some human research that they're doing in the States has showed that blue light to the eye directly stimulates the part of the brain that controls mood. So while I always thought, oh, it's a, you know, it'll take a couple of days and weeks to see a benefit, where we've heard feedback from people who just put their the light mask on or just put horses in a stable, they immediately see a change in behavior and mood. And we think that that's the reason, because when you have those blue LED lights mixed in with all the rest of them to just ensure you're getting the, the wavelengths that the sun would normally provide to stimulate kind of like the happiness hormones, when you get that in the stable, the horses respond to it. And I, I hope to, I'd like to think that's what you're seeing too, Sam. Yeah, I, I, I think that there's a big misconception when, when people are experiencing, you know, kind of temperament problems, but we'll call it that. Even in terms of, of calling a horse a hot horse, um, I just think sometimes it's an irritated horse, you know, and that can be, look, it can be back pain, it can, it can, it can be physical things, but it can also be, you know, internal thing. It can be a lack of nutrition. You know, people kind of think, oh, um, you know, the horse is trying to buck me off. I need to feed him even less. Uh, and this horse is getting nothing. And it's just not, it, they're just in a bad mood. And it's like us, you know, when, when we're, when we're a little bit, um, you know, in the depths of, depths of winter on a, on a gloomy day, you know, you could go lethargic and switch off and not want to get off the sofa. Or you could just be a bit irritated and a bit short and a bit sharp. And for me, that's what's you're, you're trying, you're trying to solve that the, the same problem will just manifest itself in different ways and in, in different people and in different horses. But we definitely notice two types of personalities, both enjoying themselves and, and, and benefiting. And, and look, we love the, we love the aesthetics of, uh, you know, taking off that rug and, um, and seeing that lovely shiny coat underneath. Uh, there's there's kind of no more satisfying feeling than that, um, and it's interesting actually. By what I what 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 re- resonated with me there a little bit, um, and it's kind of happened, but a little bit more by accident than by design. But when you were when we switched from talking about quantity of, of daylight more with the with the mares and um, you know the, the natural the length of the day to then actually just the quality of light during mm-hmm. the day, even in the winter, even when they when the body is saying it's winter that the quality of light that really resonated with me because again, by accident, we're having to sort of share fields at the moment. We have the folds are going out in, in one, uh, during the day, and then they're in pens at nighttime and the yearlings go out, um, at nighttime and they're in during the day. And it's just cause we, you know, we, we need the field space, but also cause we, we want to give, give the horse a bit of feed and things like that. And it's always easier when they're in, but what's great is that the, the yearlings who are in during the day, they're in under lights. And even though that has nothing to do with their, you know, lengthening their day, what it is doing is ensuring that the, the quality of the daylight is there. So that's um, that's cool. And of course, we could be doing that with masks for, say, the brood mares who are also out in the field. They're out all the time. Um, so we use masks with them. That's what our mares who will be, who are, you know, a little bit a little bit earlier in the season. Um, they have their masks on. So it's cool. It's cool to hear it all making sense and it and it is and that's kind of why i said at the at the top of the show i think for people i always think about myself you know in in these situations and and how i feel on those couple of days where i think i really notice it when you, you have those days where it never really gets light and you think kind of think it was like it was like dusk all day 
And then thankfully, I'm about an hour south of Kildare, but today the sun's really been through. And those are the days that you just go, I mean, we had a horrendous October and I can remember then in, in and November is pretty bad as well, just raining all the time. And when it's raining, it's gloomy. And then we had a dry day, but a dry day when the sun burst through for a few hours during the middle of the day and you just went, oh my God, there it is again. Big smile, loads of, you know, wanting to go outside and do stuff. And it definitely does have a, have a positive effect on us. So Barbara, what else is, um, you know, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of other, other people now who maybe not, not to do with breeding, um, but looking forward to the 2023 season and, and wanting to turn things around, or are there any other things that we could be helping to correct um, using light? What, what else is going on in the Equiloom labs right now? What are the research <laughs> are you uncovering for us? Well, I don't know if I should be telling you, but we do have some really interesting preliminary data from some cool projects that we're doing on certain conditions that horses suffer from. And a lot of this came to us from feedback from clients who said, I have a horse with Cushing's disease. I've used the light mask to reduce their hypertrichosis, their heavy coat growth, and it seems to have really helped. And what we've, we're running at the moment is a very large scale study that is looking at whether we can improve the quality of life for horses that suffer from certain conditions by giving them blue light, long day blue light. And kind of the, the, the early feedback from the results seems to be that particularly with Cushing's, these horses have, have lethargy and depression. They have a degeneration of the neurons that produce dopamine in the brain. So they have a kind of an increased stress response to everything. Um, and what we found when we put the blue lights on them and our finding is that in, it's improving their energy levels, their muscle development, and slightly reducing the amount of heavy coat that they grow in the winter. But these are early results and they need to be statistically analyzed and peer reviewed and all of that. But I'm starting to have a really good feeling about that. Another one, which um, is a really heartbreaking condition that about one to two percent of horses experience is head shaking syndrome um, that is caused by um, incorrect activity or overstimulation of the trigeminal nerve on the, the horse's face. And anyone who has seen, a, a, who owns or has ridden or worked with a horse that's a head shaker knows how disturbing it is when there's very, very little you can do for these horses. And in particular, geldings seem to suffer from it predominantly. And there's a hypothesis, a theory out there that it's because when you castrate a gelding, you remove a lot of their ability to produce testosterone. And testosterone has a feedback effect on the brain when springtime happens. And there's big production of reproductive hormones, even in our male horses in the spring. But without the ability to turn off this big production of reproductive hormones, geldings seem to be overstimulated. And somehow this affects the neurophysiology of the trigeminal nerve and can result in head shaking. So we've been doing a trial to see if we can prevent these horses from seeing such a big change in the lighting as it comes into spring. So instead of what we are always trying to do with our breeding stock in, is change the lighting and advance it so that they come into season, we want these horses to not see a big difference in light throughout the year. And by using light masks at the right time of the year, we're evaluating whether we can prevent the symptoms from getting bad in these horses that have this seasonal onset head shaking. And the early results are showing that there is definitely hope there that we might be able to do some bigger studies that show that blue light therapy can help with these type of conditions as well, which is really good from a welfare point of view. Wow. And um something that i'm particularly excited about <laughs> yeah for sure i can that i mean that's that is mass um and again i just uh I, you know it's so interesting listening to how um all this kind of uh, th this insight into how that into how the body works and um i'm definitely now have a have an even stronger case not to be castrated because i don't want to turn my head straight <laughs> <laughs> But it, it's, it's, God, it's, it's fascinating. 
one one other point, just just a, a funny comment. When I was at that big biological rhythms conference back in May, and like as I said, there's all species, a lot of human research. There was a poster there from a professor in the states who was looking at cluster headaches caused by trigeminal nerve pain in in humans, and he showed that it was that there was a link between this condition and a dysregulated internal clock. So circadian rhythms that are messed up was giving, was having a, a playing a role in, in the human condition. And I was like, oh, I wonder, is that the same as going on in head shaking in horses? And he just looked at me a little bit funny. And I was like, yeah, well, it's the same. It's light and clocks and pain in the face. And so it was, um, it's really interesting to see how across different species that light and the circadian rhythm can can be so powerful. And hopefully we can continue to find ways to improve conditions by using light effectively. Oh, it's, it, it, it is fascinating. The mind never stops boggling at it all. Um, and folks, yeah, if, if you're looking to, to, to bring this into your, into your horse's life, um, I really think we need Humiloom as well as Equiloom. Um, because humans, you know, we're, we're thinking about it as well. But uh, equiloom.com, everything is is there. It's you know, you can follow Equiloom on on social media, and you you can check out the website, and um, you'll be directed from there where, where to get your hands on either either masks or um, stable lights. We use both just because we have um, we have between the mares and between the performance horses. You know, we, they. Um, but both are suit best in different situations. So there we go. Barbara, Dr. Barbara Murphy, thank you so much for joining us again. I get, I get very formal at the beginning and end. <laughs> thank you, time. Mr. Sam Watson. Yeah. Well, look, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep all the studies um, and stuff. It just, um, uh, it's, it, it's fascinating. And, and again, I just, at, at this time of year, it gives us such a lift to to look around from the we've been gradually over the last five years it started off with a row of stables and then it was both rows of stables in the stable yard and then we have the barn and then we have all of the the pens now as well um so the whole place is is under lights and as i say the mayor's out with their masks on as well it just gives you a lift to know that um that the horses are getting the same quality of treatment as you say uh which is being brought in in the human world with office lighting and all that kind of stuff um the correlation is there but now the solution is absolutely here as well thanks to equilum so thank you and we will no doubt be talking to you in 2023 and getting more uh little gems and insights along the way Thank you for listening to this episode of the Eventing Podcast Classics. Don't forget that the entire back catalogue of the show are available to go back and listen to for free on your chosen platform or just go to equiratings.com forward slash podcast and you can find the link to go and look back and peruse them at your leisure. There's over 500 previous podcasts, everything from interviews, event previews and reviews, you name it, it is all available for you to go back. So why not go and have a delve and see what you might listen to next. For now though, that is all we've got time for. We'll be back very soon with more. Hi, I'm Sparkles Watson, and one of my favorite Carde and Martin products is Dream Coat. It is a fantastic product that I use all the time at home and at competitions. It makes their coat really gleam, and also it stops them getting rug rubs or any rubs anywhere on their body. It's fantastic, and it smells beautiful.